Well, now we go quickly to Massachusetts because they decided that now we were ready to tour Massachusetts. In fact, it was Mr. Whittier who thought maybe Massachusetts might be ready and for that, us. Yes. So, they really weren't, but we thought that they were at the time. Yes. So we came north to Massachusetts. And we stayed, some of the time, we stayed in, um, in Mr. Whittier's sister's house. Mary, Mary. welcomed us in. Yes. And, yes. and we, we started to, we started. We, were, we did, we did um, many meetings, over 80 meetings. We, or 80, I should say 80 towns we met in. Sometimes we would go more than once. For instance, Amesbury. We did not speak once in Amesbury. We spoke two times, and then was it a well, third it, time? Well, actually, there was a little matter that happened here, and that there, we were challenged by a gentleman who decided to stay and listen to us. And uh, we were invited to debate this gentleman on issues related to the Bible and slavery, which allowed us to come three times to Amesbury, and was actually the beginning of some discomfort for us, in that... <laughs> She won the debate. That's yes. The <laughs> now, Mr. So then they wanted us to come back, and maybe they thought then he'd win. Well, I Mr. Wright of Amesbury wrote a letter to that as extent that in The Liberator led it to look like we were speaking as much about women's rights as the rights of slaves. But in fact, yes. we came to be talking about human rights. But yes. some tension arose within the anti-slavery society of those who thought we were yes. on an important mission and those who thought we were, in fact, taking away some of the energy. Yes. Now, in and the, the beginning... And the, the pastors no longer oh, were happy yes. having us come to the church. In see. fact, we spoke in Amesbury in early July, and by late July, a pastoral letter went out from the Association of Massachusetts Churches. And this letter, let me read you just one paragraph of a many-page document. The power of women is in their dependence, flowing from the consciousness of the weakness which God has given her for her protection. But when she assumes the place and tone of man as a public reformer, our care and protection of her are unnecessary. She yields the power which God has given her for her protection, and her character becomes unnatural. I replied to the pastor. Yes, you letter. did, dear. I'm just going to read you a little. I did write many pages. I, I said, this has ever been the language of man since he laid aside the whip as a means to keep women in subjection. He spares her body, but the war he has waged against her mind, her heart, and her soul has been no less destructive to her as a moral being. How monstrous, how monstrous is the doctrine that woman is to be dependent on man. We were so pleased that Mr. Whittier wrote a poem in our defense. In fact, it was called the Pastoral Letter Poem. His opening stanza reading, and it was printed in the Liberator. So this is all in the utmost reach of priestly power, the mind to fetter. When laymen think, when women preach, a war of words, a pastoral letter. Yes. So uh, I ask, you see, now, uh, should yes, I say? Yes, so I, I think you, I say, or you know do what? I? Let's just share what happened next, because unfortunately, Mr. Whittier took some heat for his defense of us. Yes. There was some discomfort between many members of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and not long after, my sister and I received another publicly posted letter from Mr. Whittier, which was of a much and different then nature. From Mr. Weld. First, and Mr. No? Weld as well. Yes. Our two mentors, our and they teachers. They were close friends, you know, Mr. Weld yes. and Mr. Whittier. In fact, it might be important here just to tell you yes. that they had a pledge between the two of them. Mr. Weld and Mr. Whittier had vowed that they would not marry 
until all slaves were freed. That was as close as their brotherhood went. Yes, so. Oh, oh, excuse me so much. I don't know what that noise is, but I have a funny sense I'm making it. Mr. Whittier's letter. It, it, is, it, is it not forgetting the great and dreadful wrongs of the slave to pursue a selfish crusade for women's rights? Is that not a paltry grievance of your own? Let us first wake up the nation to lift millions of slaves of both sexes from the dust, and then it will be an easy matter to take millions of females from their knees and set them on their feet. Now, I ask, may I just say this? Well, you better let them know this was your response to ah. Mr. Whittier. <laughs> I ask no favors of my brethren. All I ask is that they will take their feet off our necks and permit us to stand upright on that ground which God designed us to occupy. And I, I must say, I do apologize to any of the men who will take this, but I'm sure they won't take this in the wrong way. I wrote a public letter to Mr. Whittier and Mr. Weld. This invasion of our rights was just such an attack upon us as that made upon the abolitionists in general when they were told that they had no right to discuss the subject of slavery. The time to assert a right is the time when that right is denied. So we must assert this right, for if we do not, it will be impossible for us to go on with the work of emancipation. So although Mr. Weld and Mr. Whittier asked us to desist, I'm afraid my sister and I continued, but no longer with their blessing or within the churches. We met in barns and we met on, on commons. We Often met outside. greeted by rotten tomatoes, yes. And they called Angelina Devilina. They said we were only fit in to marry monkeys. However, we had a mission. We were carrying with us a petition for the women to sign. Yes, Our and many of them did. Many of them didn't, but many of them did sign. It was an anti-slavery petition, of course. And um, we had over 1,800 signatures by women. So we realized it was time to deliver it to legislature, and it was actually over dinner with Mr. Stanton that we let him know it was time. And, and he, he remarked... He, he said, well, inasmuch as these are women's signatures, perhaps a woman should deliver them to legislature. And I said, what a marvelous ha, ha, idea, ha, Mr. Said. Stanton, and I think I knocked the wind out of him when I agreed with his humor. So I went immediately to the American Anti-Slavery Society and asked permission to deliver the petitions to legislature. And they said no. So then I went to Mr. Weld. And I said, Theodore, I would like to deliver the petitions. And, and what is your perspective on this matter? And he replied, again to our amazement, Angelina, in that you are a woman... You never signed the contract that the other 78 agents signed. So as far as I'm concerned, you are free to do as you wish. And that was all the permission I needed. So on February 21st, 1838, my sister climbed the stairs of the State House in Boston, Massachusetts. My own sister was quite ill at that time and couldn't attend with me. Oh, but Mrs. Chapman attended. Mrs. Chapman was there, but as I, as I walked up the hill, Beacon Hill, to the, the State House, I could feel my knees giving way, for there was over a thousand people gathered outside to greet me. And then I remembered that young woman who I had encountered so many years before, the woman for whom I had no words to help. But today I had words, and I planned to use them. So I stood inside the Massachusetts State House, and I spoke for two hours on the first day. And they invited me back, and I spoke for two hours on the second day. And this is a bit of what I said. I stand before you as a Southerner, exiled from the land of my birth by the sound of the lash and the piteous cry of the slaves. I stand before you as a moral being, 
And as a moral being, I feel that I owe it to the suffering of slaves and to the deluded master, to my country and to the world to do all I can to overturn this system of complicated crimes. And in that I had their attention, I thought that I should include that my idea of whatever is morally right for a man to do is morally right for a woman to do because I recognize no rights but human rights. The rights of the slave and the rights of women blend like the colors of the rainbow. My sister. Thank you, thank you. My sister was the first woman to ever address a legislature in this country. Yes. After our, our time at legislature, I, I began to worry about what Mr. Whittier and Mr. Weld might be thinking of us, especially Mr. Weld. So I, I wrote a very private letter just asking him about his feelings about our, our tour of Massachusetts. The letter that he wrote in response once again amazed me, as Mr. Weld always has amazed me, but this in a very different way. For you see, he professed his love to me, saying, I have no expectations and almost no hope that my feelings are in any way reciprocated by you, Angelina. But indeed, when I looked in my own heart, they were. I invited Mr. Weld to come meet my sister and myself in Boston early that spring, really, in the spring of, of 1838. And, and as soon as we met, we spoke and we agreed that we would like to be married as soon as possible. And we had to apologize to Mr. Whittier for that. And so it was that my sister was married on May 14th, was it 14th, it was 14th, dear? and we agreed and we upon that date to be married in Philadelphia in that on the 16th it was to be the inauguration of Pennsylvania Hall. Yes, that's right. And all of our colleagues and brethren from the Anti-Slavery Society would be there. So it seemed quite convenient to have the wedding two days before. And we had, I mean, they had the wedding. But you know, I have to tell you, just before I go on, that they have asked me to live with them. And I appreciate, my dear, I appreciate that very much. But anyway, we had the wedding. They had the wedding. And you see <laughs> at, their, at our sister Anne's house in Philadelphia. And um, in that Mr. Well one, was not a Quaker. No. It, we would no longer be welcome in the well, Quaker faith I, I, by We Mary. had already kind of gone away from it. This to shut with. the door. Yes. Well, speaking of that, Mr. Whittier did come, but he did not come inside to the wedding. He stood outside he through the waited. ceremony that he might be able to maintain yes. his Quaker standing, you see. Yes. And inside, again, we had quite a different experience. We had two ministers, one colored and one white, but they did not, my sister says, they did not actually marry them. They married themselves. And, and the I don't understand the rule, laws. Well, the law stated that if we were to be married in the state of Pennsylvania, I would become the property of my husband, you see. So well, we invited the right. ministers right. to give their blessing, but my husband and I married ourselves by exchanging our vows, agreeing that no one would belong to anyone in this marriage. <laughs> You are a very enlightened audience. Yes. Well, it's so quickly we come to the, the convention. There was a new hall, a great new hall in Pennsylvania, built, in Philadelphia. Built by $20 donations for those who believed in free speech and the yes. right for people to gather to hear new ideas. That's right, for the freedom of speech. Pennsylvania Hall, and that is where we had our convention. We opened the hall. We inaugurated it. But you must the Anti-Slavery Society of we, Women, the American But you must know that placards gone, had gone up well before we arrived, warning yes. the citizens of Philadelphia. What did they say, dear? They said, if you 
believe in the right to own property, come and protest. And you know what they meant by the right to own property? Do you know? The right to own a human being. But I can't believe that our northern brothers and sisters were concerned about losing this right. But I do believe they were afeard that if slaves were to be freed, there would be a mixing of the races. And they yes. couldn't tolerate that. We yes. invited several of our free colored brothers and sisters to attend meeting with us. We walked in arm in arm, and the crowds that gathered the were mob. enraged by We can call it a that. mob. They even broke in at one point during the meetings that day and threw some chairs around and had to be um, evicted. But then, the next day, we came to do our meetings, and the mayor said we should not have an evening meeting because it might be dangerous. So we agreed with the mayor, and after the meeting, we gave him the key, and we went to our rooms, our respective rooms. The mayor had given a big speech saying, Go home. you have won this battle to the mob, you know, and Go home and don't worry. You won. But by evening, the crowd had they grown to did thousands, not thousands. Go home as it darkened. They, they extinguished they, the lamps. Those, yes, the lamp, the outdoor lamps. They broke into the hall and ran up and down the stairs, making fires with our books and papers. Now, Mr. Whittier, was, he had the quick wit amidst the chaos to run to a nearby home to borrow a cape and a wig that he might disguise himself, joined the mob and went into the burning building that he might gather some papers of our society under his cape. And that is all that was saved. Of yes, Pennsylvania it soon Hall. became a conflagration. By midnight, it was a pile of ruins. Burned to the ground. Since that time, as you know, much has changed. The Emancipation Proclamation, the war, and now here we are, ourselves still fighting for the vote for women, we will not rest. So although much has happened, there is still work that needs to be done. The times are still challenging. My sister and I are often asked, what might we do? Well, there is something that every man and woman here might do by showing that you are not afraid. By standing up, and speaking for the rights of those who do not have a voice, you will be saving not only their lives, but I do believe your own. Thank you for joining us in this very important work. Godspeed. Thank you very much.